This is a uh, video about uh, dying in an uh, airplane in the Andes every day and being a cannibal. <laughs> uh, it's about happiness. <laughs> uh, I remember, I think I was four, maybe five years old. It was before elementary school when the terror of death sort of entered my life as a kid. And I looked at my parents' answers, and I wasn't really very convinced in them. And uh, I got the idea they didn't totally believe their answers that they were giving to me. And so the terror sort of stayed with me for several years. And um, I forget, uh, it could have been a scientific Boy Scout troop leader uh, who was, uh, I was in a carpool going to Philip Morris, a tobacco company that to cover its guilt for murdering millions of people with tobacco, ran a scientific Boy Scout troop, which greatly benefited people like me. Once a month, we did different experiments with different equipment and gathered data and analyzed it and found stuff. It was cool. Um, but uh, I was in a carpool there, and the, in the back seat of the car, I found uh, Paul Tillich's Courage to Be. And uh, I couldn't understand uh, the words, but I so I asked the guy about the title, and he told me about Courage to Be. And uh, somehow my brain fixated on the word existentialism rather than theology. And uh, I remember after that for... I was in elementary, you know, just beginning school, first, second, third grade. And uh, I remembered, uh, you know, working to pronounce existentialism, existentialism. And um, <laughs> bothering my mother's piano students uh, who were high school kids and college kids, bothering them at the sofa to tell me what it was. And, well, I'm sure most of them had no idea what I was pronouncing, much less what the word meant. Yeah. But I eventually, after two or three years of testing people, I somewhere in the middle of elementary school, found somebody who knew what it was. And um, and then uh, once I found out what the word existentialism meant, it sounded interesting. And it addressed my fear of death. And so I decided to get the book Courage to Be four years after I had found it in the backseat of this guy's car. And um, so... <laughs> <laughs> there I was trying to read some existentialist theology book in the third or fourth grade. <laughs> I think I went after class to some teacher and asked her some questions, and she thought I was nuts. Um, but uh, I was thinking about these people who survived this Andes airplane crash, which they regularly rebroadcast on cable TV because they don't have enough new programs to fill up the slots. And... Um, uh, I don't know, 30 of their 45 friends died. But they were rugby players, so they were fairly good physiques, most of them. And uh, they ate uh, the bodies of their friends to stay alive for 70 days or so after the crash. Nobody found them. The search was given up. And uh, nice to know that people give up searching for you. <laughs> and two of the guys uh, courageously walked out over a 15,000-foot mountain and down a huge valley, 35, 37 miles of walking. And... Um, but it's the testimony of that guy who, from the beginning, wanted to walk out early. And everybody said they supported that, and then they didn't really, nobody volunteered to go with him, and they held him back. And if he had gone much earlier when he was stronger, uh, 15, 20 people wouldn't have died. And so I made a mental note to myself, if I'm in an air crash, the next day I want to walk out of there. And, um, uh, and you know, you've got to give time for the search to work, and so maybe you give them... Uh, four days or something like that, and if they're too stupid to find you in four days, then you walk out of there, and if they do find your friends, you tell your friends which way you're going so they can then go look for you. And um, it's the testimony of that one guy who saved everybody else by actually walking out and getting out. And uh, now it's 35 years later, and they still have him on being interviewed, and he uh, came back and he decided to be an automobile racer at age 40. Because he really loved it, and he decided from that terrifying incident of living with his own death every day for 70 days that uh, this this whole thing is about uh, enjoying this wonderful show you have called life, just to the fullest. Whatever would make you the most thrilled, do it, and stop whatever compromised middle-class direction you're going in and find a thing that you absolutely love about life and do it to the, the hilt your last 20 years, your last 10 years, whatever you're 
whatever God gives you. Uh, it's that spirit of uh, it's a terrific show, and we have so many billion things to unterrificize our day every day. Just stop doing that. You know, one thing about beer <laughs> and and decent wine is in a little tiny bubbly way terrificizes crummy day. <laughs> it does. It sort of knocks down a few fences and a few uh, rules and a few constraints and a few fears and a few worries and uh, sort of expands uh, the, the joy of just being human and being alive on the planet. I think small animals do that too. Kittens take such intense fun in kittening. You know, chasing balls of wine, of twine, and and climbing up window screens, and getting stuck at the top, and meowing to be saved, and uh, you just watch their joy of living, and you know, you say, well, yeah, what is it that about humans that makes them build all this crap in our heads that makes us unable to to be kitten-like? Uh, so this is a, just a little tiny video on uh, reminding me and reminding us all that. Uh, 99% uh, of the ambitions and plans and stuff in your head is, uh, like the Buddhists say, nothing but uh, steps to suffering that separates you from the immense joy of simply being alive for a second.